Thank you, Joe. Um, and thank you everybody for still being with us at the end of the day. Um, this was going to be a very, very different talk, a very different keynote indeed, and it was going to be presented at Phosphogy Europe in Latvia in a couple of weeks' time. But COVID has hit us, we've got no Phosphogy Europe, we've got no Phosphogy Global, um, and I thought, I'll keep the title. What I didn't realise was that talking at the very end of this, are we nearly there is a really good question, and I can assure you, we are nearly there. So what I'm going to do in the next 20 minutes or so is I want to have a look at how phosphagies have evolved over the last decade or more, um, give you a few of my thoughts on running this first online phosphagy, and then some thoughts on what the future of phosphagy might look like. Um, a question that you might all, I would have asked you to all put your hands up, but don't, you don't need to put your hands up, but when you get the questionnaire after the event, one of the questions I, we're asking you is, have you attended a phosphagy before? And it's really interesting to us to know how many new people are attending a phosphagy for the first time. So please answer that question. So we've been holding phosphagy conferences for much more than a decade. They go back to about 2006. Um, since 2011, the conferences have been big. They've been in the order of 800 people. Um, they've grown to nearly 1,200 people. We have big venues, uh, big conference centers, which means we have big costs. Then we have a big sponsorship drive to raise money so that we can subsidize the ticket prices. And still, it costs something like $650 for an early bird. It was a bit cheaper last year in Bucharest, but on average, those are the sorts of prices. And at the end of all of that, um, Phosphagy contributes a modest surplus to OSDO. Now, if you've been following the conference mailing list um, over the last five years, you'll know that we've periodically discussed almost every aspect of running a global Phosphagy. And not surprisingly, we haven't made much progress because there are lots of different opinions on everything. So let's have a look at some of the issues that we've considered. Well, the first one is costs. Um, how do we keep the costs down? A delegate pass with workshops can be anything from six to eight hundred dollars. Travel and accommodation, if you're not in the country that's hosting the phosphagy, can easily exceed that. You know, people can, are concerned about the, the cost of the registration, but actually getting to the event and staying in a new city for a week will cost you a lot more than six hundred and fifty dollars. Um, and the truth is that big venues that can host a thousand people are very expensive. The only exception to that is if you can use universities and they're willing to donate their premises for a conference. And then you have to hold the event during the university holiday periods. And that doesn't always fit in with other people's timetables. So the question that we've wrestled with is, do we prioritize low cost over high quality? And what about generating some kind of surplus for OSDO's other activities? Um, the current model that we've used has on average generated something like 80 to $100 per delegate to, um, to OSGO. But be clear that that is all funded through sponsorship. Second thing we've always been wrestling with is accessibility. Um, and we say that we want to spread our message around the world. We want to grow usage of our software and tools, and we want to welcome more people from new regions into our community. But Phosphagy excludes people, not intentionally, but it excludes people because of wealth, because of distance, and because of time. You know, to attend a global Phosphagy, you've really got to take a week out of your out of your calendar and for some people if their employers won't sponsor them it's not only the personal expense but it's the fact that you have to use a week's holiday. Um, some of the locations that we have been to and have looked at are not necessarily welcoming to some sections of our community. For example, when we went to Dar es Salaam two years ago they have very draconian laws pro prohibiting um, homosexual 
relationships which uh, discouraged a number of people quite understandably and that was a mistake we didn't realize that but we learned from that um, and the truth is that our current model means that we can't reach many of the people that we want to meet um, so the current model of a big global event and slightly smaller regional events isn't sustainable environmentally. Flying people around the world isn't good. Um, big conferences create lots of environmental footprint, uh, lots of swag and other stuff seems to go along with them. And um, in, in my opinion, we should be banning swag from any phosphagy in the future. Um, and just generally, you can't make a global conference sustainable, you know, and you've then got to trade off sustainability um, and global and accessibility. And additionally, um, in terms of financial sustainability, um, what we, we know is that over the last few years, this chart shows how much revenue OSGO as an organization gets um, from direct sponsorship, that's the pale blue lines, and how much revenue it gets from the surpluses from Phosphor G, which are the green lines. And what you can see is that over the last decade, um, the amount of direct sponsorship of OSGO has fallen dramatically, whilst the surpluses being generated from Phosphor G have risen to fill the gap. Um, bottom line, without Phosphor G, OSGO is going to have to find a new financial model. Um, one of the past chairs said to me offline, right now our system is that several groups of inexperienced phosphagy enthusiasts offer a dream. The conference committee and board nod and say, here's $40,000 to $100,000 to get you started. We'll see you in 14 months. And then occasionally they throw in a few additional demands on the team. At some point down the road, 14 to 20 months after the dream, a check of an indeterminate amount might come back to OSGO. Despite how crazy this all sounds, it does mostly work pretty well. Or at least it did until Calgary, when cancelling Calgary came up with a bill of nearly $60,000 in the payments that we had to make to the venue and to other providers who we contracted with. So, <laughs> Put simply, something needs to change. You know, the conference committee haven't been ignoring these problems. We've been trying various initiatives to address some of these issues. And I'm gonna just give you a couple of those. The first is recording and streaming. Um, in 2013, when I and Joe and Anthony were running Phosphagy in Nottingham, uh, we had a group of volunteers and a sponsor recording the presenters' voices and screen cam capturing their slides and sort of synchronizing the two. A month or so later, we had most of these converted to video and uploaded to YouTube. In 2014, most of the sessions were recorded. In 2015, they had a proper video set up. By 2016, the C3 VOC team had a professional set up recording all of the sessions and live streaming them. 2017 was much the same, but it was done by an in-house team and it was an enormous burden on them. In DAR, in 2018, they only recorded the plenary and some of the keynotes. And in 2019, C3BOC were back to record and stream the event. Um, so gradually we've got to recording everything, we've got to streaming it. Is it worthwhile? Well, we know that some of the recordings are watched by many thousands of people. In fact, the highest that I could find was over 30,000 people had watched one of the recorded sessions from a phosphor G. The cost of recording and streaming varies from $10,000 to $50,000, depending on volunteer capability and the constraints of the venue. Um, but and this is the problem. Watching a stream is not the same as being at an event. You can't ask questions or interact with other attendees. And watching a recording retrospectively is even more remote. So the second initiative that we've had to help with the cost of attending Phosphor G is the travel grant program. We've been running that for the last three years. In 2017, uh, we helped 12 people to travel to Boston. In 2018, we had nearly 100 people in helped 
to get to Dar es Salaam. And in 2019, we helped 30 people to get to Bucharest. Um, even at Dar, with enormous funding from the World Bank, the travel grant support only reached about 10% of the attendees. In 2020, everyone who wanted to attend Phosphor G UK, wherever they were in the world, could attend at no cost. That is a remarkable achievement, and it was done with literally simple off-the-shelf technology and a few hundred dollars. So that brings me to 2020. Um, and it's time to send my sympathy and all of our solidarity to our friends in Calgary and to our friends in Valmiera. And it's my opportunity to show you my third t-shirt of the day. But we know what happened to Calgary and Valmiera. Um, that's what brought us to Phosphodeal Online. Um, a group of us had been talking about running a one-day event in the UK this year. We did, thought it would be a physical event and it would be hosting 150, maybe 200 people at the most. Um, but then everything changed and we decided that we were going to go online. And when we went online, we realised that we could go just a little bit bigger than 150 people. So, let me just say a few words about today's event and how it's gone and what's worked and what hasn't worked. Well, first up, we Zoomed. Um, and I want to thank the thousands of people who followed our tweets, the nigh on a thousand people who signed up for, for the conference without questioning our choice of Zoom. Um, a couple of people inevitably had to say, Zoom, really? Isn't there a fossil that you can use? But only a couple. We looked at every single option we could find. Uh, we looked at commercial products, we looked at um, free and open source products, and yes, it might be possible to do this with open source software, but we have six volunteers running this event for most of the time, and none of us had the technical skills or the bandwidth to run an event where we had certainly over 500 and maybe 600 people online at the same time. Um, and Zoom enabled us to do that. Um, somebody else may come up with a better solution in the future, but um, for us, we were clear that we didn't need to have a whole team worrying about technology. We could just let somebody else do that. So, let me tell you what I think worked. I mean, you'll give us feedback afterwards. We ran an event for a thousand people registered. I think probably six, seven hundred of you have logged on at some time and we've certainly peaked at over 500 people connected. Um, and we did all that for free. And that's pretty, pretty amazing, really. Um, we asked you to donate and quite a few of you have donated and hopefully more of you will donate after the event. We did this with a team of six. That's remarkable. Anyone who's organized a conference for nearly a thousand people knows you don't do it with six people. On the day we've had about another dozen volunteers, which we're also grateful for, but it's pretty easy to do this online like this. Um, we've made a truly global event. Um, as I said, there've been nearly a thousand people registered for this event. You come from 77 different countries. I think that's over a third of the countries in the world are represented at this Foster G. And over half of you are not from the UK, which is even more remarkable. So um, yeah, that's a pretty incredible achievement. And we've had speakers from the west coast of the United States from all over Europe. You know, it's been a remarkable achievement getting all these people together. Hopefully the gaps in the program enabled you to get a cup of coffee, um, just chill out. Maybe you even went and sat in a different room and didn't watch a session. You know, we, we designed the program so that people didn't feel they had to be online the whole time. And hopefully that's worked for you. Um, if you've missed something, uh, because of the scheduling, scheduling, we've recorded everything and you should be able to watch it in about a week's time. 
and hopefully the tech wasn't too disastrous it wasn't a barrier to you enjoying the day and what's been remarkable considering some of the bad publicity zoom has had over the last month or two for their security which i have to say has improved we haven't been trolled or zoom bombed or anything like that so what could we have done better these again are my views they're not the team's views they're just my views um it's difficult to stay focused for a whole day a whole day of online conferencing is possibly too much um and one thought that i've got is should we split it into two or three chunks over a few days or even over a few weeks i'm not sure the intensity of the event is great um it's also exhausting for us as the organizers and probably for you as the participants um, networking doesn't really seem to um to be easy in an online environment i'm not sure how well the coffee bar worked um i've been in there a couple of times there were only a few people i don't know whether that was because people didn't know about it or just because they wanted to either be in sessions or chilling out and not online um, I think we need to explore other ways to make an online event more participative and also to make it more social. Um, there was no social program for this event. We couldn't, um, we just didn't have the time to think of how we might organise one. And those are things that whoever comes next will need to think about. Um, the no shows. Um, it's inevitable if you have a free event that people will register and then they won't turn up. Um, that's not a criticism, it's just the reality. Um, maybe we should have made a nominal charge that would have encouraged people to turn up. I don't know whether it matters or not. We certainly bought larger scale technology than we needed for the numbers who showed, but maybe it doesn't matter. Um, it's certainly something for others to think about in the future. And finally, we had no sponsorship. We had no sponsorship because we didn't quite know how we would engage with sponsors in a sort of meaningful way for them, how we could give them value for their sponsorship. And we also had no sponsorship because we just didn't have the bandwidth again. Um, We've organised this conference in, I think, about six or seven weeks from start to finish, you know, so it's been a pretty rushed thing and sponsorship was something that got missed. But certainly, if you were going online and you were going to carry on contributing to OSGO, um, we would need to find a way to deliver value to sponsors and get them to sponsor us because um, that's a crucial part of running the phosphagy. Um, so some thoughts for whoever goes next and um i wonder how many people are of an age where they'll even recognize this image but um you can tell me afterwards um i've been doing phosphagies for eight years now i've chaired one i've vice chaired another and i've just been a helper on several others i've been on the conference committee for seven years and i've run the travel grant program for the last three years that's not a boast, that's just to say, I've got a bit of track record in organizing phosphagy events. So what follows are my personal thoughts on what could come next. And let me start by talking about what I think is the essence of a phosphagy. And first up, it's education, first and foremost. We learn from each other, we teach each other, and we discover new opportunities to do things. Um, and that's the core part of a phosphagy is educating people and informing people. And in most phosphagies, there's a workshop program. It's either a day beforehand, two days beforehand, but there's always a workshop program. We didn't have a workshop program. To start with, we were uncertain as, whether to, as to whether the technology would enable us to, to run a, a workshop program. In practice, we now know that you probably could run a workshop program but we didn't have time to organize it they take quite a lot of time to organize and you need the volunteers to deliver the workshops so we've learned from nick beerman how he's delivered training and i think future people in the future people are going to have to find ways to get workshops running pretty as part of a, a phosphagy 
that's online or partly online. Um, the other thing is that the presentation format, whether it's live or virtual, is a pretty limited educational th format as a lot of university undergraduates and students are learning at the moment. We need to be more into innovative in how we use the virtual and physical environments to engage people and enable them to learn from each other in the future. Second up in my sort of key elements of what makes a phosphagy is community. And um, phosphagy is sometimes described as a gathering of the tribes. It's where we catch up with old friends, where we meet new friends. Um, it's the very core of our community. And without um, a phosphagy, all we are are a load of remote con code contributors and a bunch of mailing lists. And that's not to say it's a bad thing, but you don't build a community when all you're doing is hacking code and communicating on mailing lists, or not in my opinion. Stuff gets done and people volunteer because of the encouragement of others. And whilst that can happen in a virtual environment, face-to-face -face at a, an event is a big factor in getting new people involved in the community. Those of us who are on the inside will manage in a virtual event. Um, but those who are new may struggle and they may feel lost and we need to work on that. And perhaps with planning, we could buddy new people with old hands who could suggest sessions to them and make some introductions to other people for them. So going forward, I think we're going to need to focus on how we can be more welcoming to new participants if we stay online. I've talked about outreach already. Um, you know, people at Phosphagy think we're on a mission from God. Another quote from an old movie that you might not have seen. Um, we want to evangelize the use of open source geo to people around the world. And we want particularly to reach those countries where the costs of proprietary software preclude its use in education, government and civil society. Accessibility has been a challenge. How can people in countries with incomes of less than $400 a month, let alone those with incomes of less than $100 a month, consider attending a physical conference anywhere in the world, even in their own country? Even if attendance is free, the costs of travel are going to be prohibitive. Um, we need to work at making phosphagy more accessible. And in my opinion, online is the way. I've talked about social, it's, it's what makes, it's the thing that makes it more than the conference and it's how we get to meet people and we make those new friends and it's a really important part of a conference and if we're going to be online or hybrid we need to find ways to make social work. And the last part of a phosphagy is the code sprint. Um, it's a key element of almost every phosphagy that I've been to whether it's local, regional or global, there's a code sprint. Um, we didn't have the bandwidth to organise a code sprint this year, but if any part of Phosphagy is ripe for adapting to online, it's the code sprint. In fact, most code sprints today in the past that have been face to face already have an online channel running in some way. So um, with the kind of tech that we've got now, it should be easy to do that. So how do I think a post-COVID phosphagy 2021, that's Buenos Aires by the way, or 2022, undecided at the moment, is going to look? Well, the first thing is, there are gonna be a lot of planes parked up on tarmac somewhere and most people aren't going to want to fly. So, Let's just have a couple of thoughts on how we might evolve phosphagy in a post-COVID world. And right up front, I think, is a need to make our events hybrid. Um, somehow we need to combine online and face-to-face. -face. We need to have um, something that enables people to attend phosphagy without travelling very far, but still enables people to meet up and be together. Um, and that could be as simple as making the live stream channels more interactive and more engaging, or it could actually mean mixing face-to-face -face and online streams in some way. However we do that, 
we need to think about how we prevent the online participants becoming second class citizens um, to, the, to the people who are physically at the event. Um, and that's going to be a challenge, but it's certainly something we're going to have to think about. One way would be to consider local link ups. Could we run an event where people gather in small to medium sized groups that might be 30, it might be 50, it might be even 100 um, to watch the streams together, possibly with some of the, the content actually physically taking place in that venue and being streamed to the other participants. Um, and could we have those going in tens or hundreds of cities at the same time so that um, you could both experience live talks and watch stuff online with other people. Could we run a global hybrid event based in more than four countries um, with lots of it online and some of it being face to face? Um, I think the answer is yes, but what we know is that however we do this, we have to make certain that we don't make the online participants second class citizens. And um, I think that at the end, as we come out of COVID, it's more and more likely that we're not going to want to go back to um, monolithic conferences in a single venue with enormous costs of travel and the environmental damage that that's doing. So no second class citizens, please. And that's it, we, we're nearly there. We aren't there yet in terms of online conferences, but what I'm certain of is that we're not going to go back to the way it was. Um, we're going to have to adapt and I'm hoping that somebody out there watching this keynote is going to stick their hand up and they're going to wave or they're going to send a message to us and they're going to say, well, we want to run the next online phosphor gene because what I can promise you is that it's not going to be Joe, Alistair, Anthony, Matt, Dave, or me who are doing the next one. We're going to need a rest. Um, and Joe, that's where I'm going to pause for a minute for any questions that you've got for me. Great. Well, um, thanks, Stephen. Um, so first of all, uh, we've had some thanks from various people who have said that they, it is the first time they've been able to attend a phosphagy and they have only been able to attend it because it was online. So there we go. That's, that's uh, answers at least some of our questions. Yeah. Um, so some of them have kind of already been really addressed uh, by kind of later parts of your talk. But uh, one of the things, one of the suggestions is whether phosphagy should actually become a core OSGO project um, with a with a subsidiary goal of, of fundraising, which is an interesting idea. Um, so uh, I, I wonder if that would mean that it had a more uh, a more permanent kind of committee, perhaps. So that's uh, that's one question. If, I don't, if you've got any thoughts about that, well, in a way, that's what the conference committee does. Um, so the conference committee is made up of the chairs of about the last 10 uh, global phosphagy conferences. Um, the mailing list is open to everybody, but the conference committee is a small group of people who run the process for choosing the location for the next phosphagy. We also provide advice to the organisers of phosphagy events, we run the travel grant program. Um, so apart from the fundraising bit, we do most of that. Um, and then the people who are running the events, um, they unfortunately at the moment have the responsibility for raising the sponsorship. I think there is a good case for looking at whether we should be raising the sponsorship as the conference committee. I also think there's a really big case for OSGO board. If there's anybody on the board listening into this talk, I'm talking to you. Um, it's about time the board looked at its long-term financial stability and how it would 
be able to keep OSGEO going if phosphagees stopped returning 80, 100, 120 thousand dollars a year in surpluses? Because um, that's a major part of phosphagees fund, OSGEO's funding. Cool. Um, so a couple of people have uh, suggested whether there might be ways of offsetting the environmental um, impact at least. Um, so I wonder if, if actually, you know, offsetting carbon um, footprint would be one way of doing it. Um, obviously, that doesn't um, it doesn't really address the issue of, of inclusivity and uh, you know, we've still got the issue that a lot of people simply can't attend the, uh, uh, you, you know, a, an event in real life. Um, but, you know, and, and as a kind of linked question, we've suggest, somebody has suggested, well, what if there were still regional events, like physical regional events, but maybe the global event itself became an online, an online one? Okay, I'll take those as two separate things if I can. Um, Carbon offsetting, or is that what it's called? Yeah, carbon offsetting is, it's a sort of, it's a bit of a fudge, isn't it, to be honest, you know, I mean, and, you know, every time we book a flight, we can chip in a little bit of extra money to carbon offset, but um, what probably, if we, if we care about sustainability, um, we're all going to have to think about not if we book a flight, how can we offset our carbon? But do we really need to book a flight? And um, sort of what I think this has shown us is that we can run a global event and we don't need to travel. And as you pointed out, um, it makes it a heck of a lot more accessible to a heck of a lot more people. So I think um, in that regard, you know, the future of a global event is going to have to have a significant online component to it. How we do that is for the people who follow to decide. Um, with regard to the regional events, um, yes regional events are inevitably going to involve less travel and no one is suggesting that nobody should be traveling at all anymore, although until Covid lets up I'm not sure how much we're going to be able to travel and it, it is possible that, um, region, you know, we We've talked a lot in conference committee about the importance of regional events and they've got bigger and bigger and more important. Um, I think even regional events would benefit from having a hybrid element to them so that um, people could, could participate online or this sort of distributed um, model where perhaps an event is taking place in three or four different venues which further reduces the travel. Um, I think it's, you know, we're going to have to try all of these things in the future, Joe. Great. Um, so we've still got a couple more questions here. Uh, we've got a question asking what, uh, from uh, Yusuf, who is a PhD student in remote sensing and GIS in his final year, and he, he, he wants to know um, really how to, how to get more involved in, he says phosphor G, but uh, I think really if we could discuss how to get more involved in the OSGO community more more generally. Um, are there, is there any place for an early career researcher? Absolutely, there's a place for everybody. Um, I don't know that we always make it as easy for people to discover how to get involved, but if you start off by going to osgo.org, um, that's a really good place to start and that will help you to find your way into getting involved. The first thing to do is to find your local community. If you're a student in the UK, OSGO UK is your local community. Um, if you go on the OSGO website, you'll find links to all of the mailing lists. Sign up for a mailing list. It's the quickest way to get in contact with the people in your local chapter. Um, ask them questions come along to our local events. Um, we really are a welcoming committee. You only need to ask and we'll find you something to do. Okay, well, so I'm going to, there are, uh, there, there are a couple of, of well, there, there are quite a few questions, but I'm just going to focus on, on two, uh, okay. two remaining questions. The first is more of an announcement that the uh, QGIS 
US user group are holding uh, an online conference, um, which is potentially going to be on two days, on July the 17th and the 24th, depending on submissions. Um, it's, it's going to be open to everybody. Uh, the registration is not actually open yet, but links will be posted in the usual channels. So if you want another uh, fix of online conferencing, then that would be a, that would be a good one to go to. Um, but this, I think, is possibly the most serious question that you need to answer, Stephen, uh, which comes from uh, from from Ed Freyfogel, which is which is your favourite T-shirt? You have to decide. Oh, without question, the uh, Bucharest 2019 T-shirt. Um, just a there second. So you can see the T-shirt there. Um, and for those of you who know me, um, last year I had a health problem, to put it mildly, and I couldn't go to Bucharest, um, where I was meant to be speaking. So all of these people got together and they signed their names on the back of a Bucharest T-shirt and they mailed it to me after the event. Um, and that T-shirt sort of symbolises the fantastic friends that I've made in eight years of being part of this OSGO community. The love and the support that they gave me when I was going through difficult health circumstances, the fun, the beers, everything that we've done together. Um, so without a question, that's my favourite t-shirt. Um, Brilliant. And if I could just add one thing, Joe, before we go to the final bit. Um, for that person who asked how to get involved and anybody else who wants to know how to get involved. Um, there's one other important channel, which is Twitter. Um, we're a tech community that use Twitter incessantly. And if you want to know what's going on, you want to follow at OSGO for the global OSGO organization and at OSGO UK for the UK organization. And there will be Twitter feeds for nearly all of the other chapters. And that's the most the instant way of knowing what's going on in our community. Um, and the, the final thing is that we've had a, a question as to whether there will be a Phosphor G uh, UK online t-shirt. Um, and the answer is no, unfortunately there won't. Um, we did consider, well, I, I was keen that we had uh, stickers um, for this event, but Again, with the small number of volunteers and the quick turnaround, um, and I, uh, we, we, we didn't really feel like we could do it. So no, uh, unfortunately there won't be a t-shirt for today's event. Um, and I think at that point, we will just move on to the final wrap up, Stephen, if that's okay. Okay, here we go. So it's that time. It's the time for the thank yous. Um, so thanks for being here. Thanks for nearly a thousand registrations. Thanks for coming from 77 countries to Phosphor UK Online. Thanks for making this a Phosphor first. It's never been done before. I'm sure it's gonna be done again and I'm sure it will be done better in the future. Thanks for donating. And if you haven't donated, please there's still time to donate go and donate to either osgo uk or map action or any other charity of your choice but just donate even if it's just the price of a cup of coffee thanks to all of our speakers every single one of them um, there are a couple of people's pictures missing because i couldn't find them on twitter and if you're not on twitter you don't exist but thank you to all the speakers Thanks to the volunteers, that's Akin Tunde, Andy, Ed, Paul, Nick, Sharon, Sid, and Yusef. Thanks to Rosalind Cuttle, who designed the Phosphor GUK online logo. Um, in case anybody hasn't got it, it's about working from home because we're suffering from lockdown in England. Um, and thanks to my friends um, on the organizing team. Joe Cook and Scott and I have now worked on at least three events together. Alistair, Matt and Dave are on their first event and we're delighted that you're here guys and uh, we look forward to you picking up the baton going forward. 
Um, we've done all this whilst nearly all of us have got day jobs. Um, and it's not easy putting an event like this together and having a day job. Um, and some of us have been incredibly busy. Um, so I think we also need to say a big thank you to our employers who've allowed us to commit some of the working time to preparing this and of course have allowed us all to be here for the whole day to make this event work. So thanks to them as well. We need your feedback. You're going to get an email in about, in fact, it's probably landing in your inboxes as I'm saying this. Um, the email includes a link to a short survey. It won't take you more than two minutes to complete the survey. We really need to know what worked, what didn't work, what you want more of, what you want less of. Um, it will help us and it will help, and we will share our findings with everybody using the OSGO wiki. We'll write up the summary of the event, how we did it, what we've learned, so that other people can take your feedback and go forward to make a better event next time. And I'm going to say this once more. I've said it a lot of times today. Um, if you were waiting to see what the event was like before you decided how much to donate, now is the time. Please, please, they're the links. Um, just go and give us the price of a cup of coffee. Um, doesn't matter how much you can afford, just give us what you can afford and we will be grateful. And so will the organizations that we're asking you to support. Um, and if you've already given and you thought it was an amazing day, then you could actually go crazy and you could give again. And that's it folks. Phosphogy UK Online 2020 is done and dusted. Good night. Travel safely, even if it's just going downstairs. See ya.